Hello and welcome to everyone to the 2021 Southeast Collaborative Online Conference. My name is Lauren Clossy and I will be your host for this session entitled Creating Accessible Virtual Storytimes for All Abilities, presented by Renee Grassi. The co-facilitator for, facilitator for this session is Dorcas Davis from the Georgia Public Library Service. This event is supported through funding from the Library Services and Technology Act through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Before we get started, I have a few things to share with you. This session will be recorded and will be archived, and a link will be sent out next week with access to the archive session and the slides, and recordings will be posted on the conference website as well. If there are other people watching this webinar with you, we would love to hear about it so that we can have a more accurate head count for our records. So please send us an email with the names of the people watching with you. You'll have an opportunity during the presentation to submit questions to the presenter. So please type them in the chat area and we will help facilitate that. Please also stay muted with your camera off as Kayla presents. And after the session, you'll receive an email with two different links. One link is for the program evaluation and another link will be to download a CEU certificate if you need that. And now I'd like to introduce Renee Grassi. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Lauren and Dorcas and everybody at the Southeast Collaborative. I am just thrilled to connect with you all today to talk about creating accessible virtual story times for all abilities. So a little bit about me. I probably like you started virtual story times. Oh, not that long ago. So um, that's really the main thing I want you to take away about me is that I'm learning and we are all learning in this space of virtual story times. Um, we started at Dakota County Library last spring. We were, I think, one of the first libraries in Minnesota to get to get started, and that also allowed for us to learn um, and, and really gain a lot of um, lessons learned from that experience. So I'm gonna share with you um, some tips and strategies for making your virtual story times more accessible and welcoming to kids with disabilities specifically, but all children will be able to benefit from these tips and strategies. So we're gonna talk a little bit about just a a brief overview of disability awareness and foundation and why this is important. And then we're gonna get into some very, very concrete tips and strategies about planning and preparing, implementing, and then evaluating your story times. And then at the end, we'll provide some just general accessibility tips and helpful resources. I want to start by saying this is not a beginning to story time training. If you're new to story time, um, this is probably going to be a training that you want to come back to after you have a very strong foundation in story time. I also want to say this is not a beginning virtual story time training. Um, if you're new to virtual story time, I would recommend checking out Web Junction, where I presented um, about an hour and a half's worth of just training for virtual story time if you're brand new. So this presentation takes you beyond virtual story time into specific strategies talking about accessibility, but there's a lot of really great information on the Web Junction and training that I highly recommend you check out. So the fact that you're here today means that you're interested in making your libraries more welcoming and accessible and by extension your virtual programming. And so we see this image on the slide and maybe some of you have recognized it before. It really speaks to this ideal, this goal of all of our libraries that we are for everyone. That is what we work towards in all of our work day in day out. But the truth is, is that there are barriers to library access services and programs. And some of those barriers are institutional racism. We're looking at compliance today, virtual compliance, inaccessibility, um, lack of digital technology and Wi-Fi access. There are going to be barriers to your library, whether you think about virtual programming or just in-person programming. 
So we need to think about a new lens. We need to have a new framework in thinking about how we can make our libraries most welcoming and accessible to those who experience the most barriers. And so what I love about this image is that it just visually represents the difference between equality and equity really plainly. On the left, you can see the image, perhaps you recognize this image um, from something else that you've seen similar. On the left, you will see a, a representation of the concept of equality. The goal for everybody is to watch the game. That's the desired outcome. And everyone is given the same supports and the same resources in order to watch that game. However, everybody individually is different from their own um, skills, interests, um, and even some of their abilities. And so the outcome is inequitable. The outcome does not match each other's. And what happens is that you have a complete disparity for some groups and a complete inequity for other groups. Instead, we need to think about libraries in our equity work as really trying to break down those barriers represented here by the fence and um, even just the desire to watch the game. Um, we really want to take a more equitable approach and that means targeted and sometimes more specialized services and supports so that each person or each individual group's barriers and inequities are addressed and then also we balance out um, the, the actual outcome. We balance out privilege so that everyone else has a more equitable experience. And ideally we're uh, hopefully achieving that goal of equity um, through more specialized and targeted supports. So when I talk about disability today and accessibility, we're going to talk in generalities, but I want to say that disability is not a monolith. Just by doing one thing or um, one specific strategy, that does not mean that you are going to be more inclusive and more welcoming to everybody in the disability community. Because just as you and I are different individuals with multiple identities that makes us who we are, so too is the disability community. And we're gonna talk about a variety of strategies that you can take that can have a more generally welcoming and more inclusive approach, but just know and keep in the back of your mind that the concept of disability really is not um, a monolith. In fact, um, it's, one, it's one of the largest, if not the largest minority in the world. Um, as we look really kind of macro and we think about disability, we realize that it's much more prevalent and it exists more than maybe we have thought of before. So in this image, 15% of the global population, that's about 1 billion people live with a disability. And since we're talking about story time today, extrapolating that out, one in 20 children have a disability. And so what are the implications of that for our story time audience, for example? Well, when we were in person in the pan before the pandemic, maybe our story times had roughly 10 to 20 children. So even without thinking about it or necessarily knowing about each individual, statistics show us that the likelihood is that at least one of those child children have a disability in that room. And so as we get a little bit more micro and we look at the United States, we look at some other statistics. Autism in the United States affects one in 54 children. And that statistic has, the prevalence rate has actually been going up in these last few years. And that also too can have implications for the communities that we serve. And also developmental disabilities are more prevalent in the United States also. One in six children have a developmental disability. And what does that mean they're born with that disability as opposed to it being acquired or happening later on in their life? Why would we talk about virtual story time being accessible? If someone has the internet and a, and a camera or a laptop, isn't that enough? Well, virtual story times 
actually can be a huge benefit to the disability community and children with disabilities and their families. First of all, libraries are inaccessible just by the mere fact that it takes time to, to, to actually go to the library. And there might be physical limitations that people have in their own lives and in their own lived experiences that inhibit them from going to the library. There also are considerable health risks for the disability community. And again, disability is not a monolith. And so it would really depend on each individual. But we recognize even here in Minnesota, our governor has identified and prioritized adults with disabilities, a large amount of disabilities to be vaccinated for COVID-19 vaccine because of the considerable health risks um, that are associated with just having having disabilities. Um, and I want to give a shout out to the person in this photo. Um, her name is Alice Wong, and she is an author on Twitter. Um, she just co-authored a fantastic compilation called Disability Visibility, 20, or First Person Stories from the 21st Century. I highly recommend it if you're willing and wanting to learn more about um, just expanding your own level of empathy and understanding about other people's lived experiences. We also know that people lack transportation, and especially for those that experience mobility disabilities, um, that lack of transportation getting to the library is a considerable barrier to access and equity. And the truth is, is that people with disabilities have less recreational opportunities and opportunities for connection and integrating and being included in community life. Um, so some of our states may have separate or different um, special recreation departments for people with disabilities and children with disabilities, where they have separate classes for recreation um, that really are designed for their needs. And as people get older, um, you know, people with disabilities are less likely to be invited for um, community events. There, there are just less opportunities for them. And so the loss of recreational opportunities opportunities for children all the way through adults with disabilities is a huge barrier to access. And we all are aware of the social isolation that we are experiencing in this pandemic, but statistics show that mental health and men mental di health diagnoses are at a higher rate and prevalence rate among the disability community, um, such things as anxiety, depression. Um, social isolation is a real concern and barrier for people with disabilities. So taking all of that into consideration, how can your library and your role as a children's librarian or working with children's librarians, how can you think about your virtual story times in a slightly different way and consider the, the possibilities to help with access to your library for kids with disabilities? Well, first we look to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And under that Disabilities Act, there actually is some information about compliance for um, video and virtual spaces. So if you want to learn more, this isn't going to be a, um, a high, a deep dive into ADA compliance, um, share this resource with your IT department or anybody who manages your virtual spaces. This talks about all of the regulations and compliances that are needed by government agencies like libraries in order to be accessible for people with disabilities. Speaking about accessibility, it's actually so much more than compliance. Compliance, if you think about it, is really the bare bones of what institutions like libraries and other government agencies need to do to make our libraries welcoming for people with disabilities. But accessibility is broader than that. It talks about and it thinks about a broad range of abilities and access and barriers to access for people across a variety of abilities and groups. And so when we think about accessibility, we're thinking about not just visual accessibility or, or virtual compliance, we're also thinking about accessibility 
for physical mobility and we're thinking about um, hearing and audio and even how we communicate information for people that might be um, developmentally disabled or have cognitive disabilities. So accessibility is really much broader than that. And if you're interested in this topic, universal design really is like the gold standard when it comes to designing programs, services, and spaces. And the Americans with Library, the American Library Association has a great resource that's free that talks about what universal design is. And I'd like to explain it by giving the example of um, curb cuts. So when the Americans with Disabilities Act first became law, Curb cuts were required by um, all government agencies and spaces in order to make people who use wheelchairs give them the ability to use and access the sidewalks. Well, we know that um, so curb cuts are not just great for people who use wheelchairs, they're also great for people who use strollers or bicyclists or um, people who have mobility issues and walk with a cane or skateboardists. Um, you know, there are a variety of benefits to a curb cut beyond just thinking about people with disabilities. So the universal design of a service or a program thinks about a broad range of abilities. So that's just an example of the concept. And so we can think about story time from that perspective too. In fact, we've really experienced a lot of benefits to universal design in the middle of COVID. Um, closed captioning, as we all know, is a great resource and I want to applaud um, the conference here today for having live captioning. Thank you so much. Live captioning, I think, is an example of universal design because it provides not only support for people who are hard of hearing or deaf, it also helps provide that additional literacy support layer for people who are learning English as a new language. It also helps people who are visual learners or process information more visually than auditorily. So closed captioning also has just a lot of really great benefits for people that are traveling to work and maybe watching a video on the train um, and they're you know, in the middle of the silent car and they really can't have their audio on. There's so many reasons why closed captioning is a benefit. And again, that's just another example of um, universal design. For those of you that are connected to your library's IT department or have any like foot in the door into um, the work at your library for your web site or your catalog or your social media, I'd highly recommend sharing this resource with those people. So the WCAG 2.1 accessibility guidelines are again like a gold star for um, people who create web and digital content. And these aren't a part of the Americans with Disability Act because that's really compliance and the web content accessibility guidelines are updated on a much more regular basis and consider a more broad range of abilities. Our library worked with, we had the, um, the great fortune of working with a company called T-Base and they provided a very comprehensive web accessibility audit for us. And they looked at our website, our catalog, our virtual library um, program calendar and our social media um, to really tell us what we were missing when it comes to some of these guidelines. And so, some of the guidelines that we see in the WCAG 2.1 point us to things that we already know are best practices. Captions for pre-recorded and live audio. In fact, if you're trying to get um, buy-in from your supervisors or your managers for things like Otter AI or closed captionings or live captioning, share them this resource and say, hey, look, this is an accessibility best practice. Um, it also talks about how content should not solely rely on things like color, size, shape, or any specific sensory characteristic in order to understand it. And I'm going to talk about that one specifically when it comes to story time, because that's really important. So when we are using visuals through our virtual story time, we need to make sure that we have multiple means of representation, that we're not just communicating information in one sense. 
So wrapping all that together, what does accessibility really mean? And I like to think about it as intentionality. In fact, equity work is intentional. We are putting our efforts towards specifically those who are underserved or marginalized or who experience barriers at our library. So that means we need to be intentional with all of these things, our planning, our setup, our content, our delivery, our post-production, so all of the, the other tech stuff that happens, and even as we evaluate and assess what we're doing in story time, um, we need to make sure it aligns with our value and our mission and our visions. Does your library spend time at the things that it says that it values. So if your library stands for diversity, equity, inclusion, are you putting your money towards things like closed captioning or live captioning? Are you putting your effort towards making sure that um, you're able to be here today to learn these topics? I think the answer is yes to that. Um, Budget and how we spend our money is an expression of our values. So if we don't put our time and our money into more equitable um, efforts, then it's really just a lot of talk and no show. We need to act in our values. So let's talk about planning. So when you're planning your virtual story times, hopefully you're doing this already. If you're not, that's okay. We're thinking about this from an ongoing learning process. We're all doing our best here and trying to gain more information about how we can do better. One of the things hopefully we're asking is what does our community want and what do they need? And it's very possible that you could be connecting with your local special education district classrooms and finding out information about, well, do they have access through their classrooms already to virtual story times? Are there things that these parents are asking for like Maybe they're asking for sign language story time. So having someone who is fluent in American Sign Language and then maybe having a co-presenter who speaks English, maybe they're interested in having um, that type of program. You really don't know until you ask. And so get out there and find out what your needs are in your community. There are lots of disability organizations in your community if you just take the moment to look. And again, starting with your special ed district is going to be a great place to start. Sometimes I've even just went on Google Maps and used keywords like disability, autism, um, you know, special recreation to see what in my community exists um, that serves people with disabilities. And you might even be really connected on things like Nextdoor or other online community groups, um, places that can help you get connected with the disability community. You're going to want to think about staff training and being here today is a great start, um, but maybe you're a manager and so you want to share this training with one of your staff or maybe your staff member um, needs a little bit more grounding and disability awareness in order to feel comfortable doing a virtual story time, for example, for um, a classroom of, of kids in special education. We want to think about using inclusive language and that not only means um, thinking about the pronouns that we use and making sure that our language is welcoming so that we're not just saying mom and dad, we're talking about parents and caregivers, so neutral language, but also thinking about ways that we can just talk about disability. Just like hopefully we're talking about differences in our story time, um, differences in race and language. Um, we can talk about disability. It's not taboo to talk about it, but unfortunately, you know, we are in a society where maybe that is a taboo. So think about talking about disability up front um, and really saying, you know, um, in a welcoming way that these characters might be different. For example, um, one uses a wheelchair to get around and one gets around by walking. Um, and that's a difference. Um, and that's okay. You know, um, it's okay to see those differences. Sometimes kids need librarians to talk about or their teachers to talk about those differences directly. 
Also want to talk about and think about your technology needs. Um, you know your library's capacity and budget and um, uh, skills best when it comes to the devices that you're using. Really get to know them and also the platforms that you're using. If you're on Facebook, do you know that you can upload an SRT file um, that will automatically align the captions with your video? Did you know that YouTube allows you to download the SRT captioning file if you have access to YouTube? Um, you know, really getting to know your platforms and understanding how they work so that you can use them accessibly. And of course, promoting that you have resources that are available for everybody. Your virtual programs are hopefully welcome and available for everybody and thinking about making that statement on your library website. In my virtual um, story time training on Web Junction, I talk about this topic in a lot more depth, so I won't go too much into it now, but I would just say proceed with caution when thinking about live versus recorded. Um, both of them have their um, positive sides and both of them have their drawbacks when it comes to accessibility. Recorded programs, I generally find, are um, allow for a lot more control over the environment, over the end product. You can add the captions, you can add um, sign language interpretation and picture in picture and a small screen. Um, it also gives staff a little bit more um, space to make a mistake and um, record over that if they if they feel like they need to do something again. But live offers that person to person connection that you just don't get with recorded and so um, there are accessibility features now with live story times we're having live captioning here in zoom and so if you do zoom story times making sure that you offer live captioning as well. Um, but you might have difficulty controlling your environment, your internet connection, your lighting, all those things you don't really know and you can't control for that in a live program. So consider the different options. I always think it's, it's great to have a little bit of both if you have the capacity and again, what does your community want? Did they give you feedback about one thing over the other? You also don't have to do story time. And um, I know that sounds, you know, like this is a story time training. Why are you saying that? But it is also up to you to decide what you have capacity for at an individual level and what your branch and your library has capacity for. Sometimes individual read alouds of one book make for really accessible videos. I like them because they're short parents and caregivers can use them in short periods of time and it doesn't require for a child of any ability to sit down for a very, very long period of time, whether it's live, Zoom or recorded and, and have their attention. Um, it also allows for a really quicker turnaround um, in order to create these videos. And what's nice about these videos is that um, you know, because we're in this age of working with publisher permissions, you don't have to worry about deleting an entire story time off your Facebook or YouTube page if one book or one publisher decides to no longer give permissions for online story time. So um, it gives you a little bit more flexibility. So we created um, a series of read alouds back when the pandemic first began. We're not doing it anymore. Um, we're, we've transitioned, but I did want to give you this as an option or an idea of something that you can do to make the experience of reading a story and sharing stories more accessible to everybody. When we think about story times, we're also thinking about information that we want to share with parents and caregivers and guardians. Those early literacy tips, um, the, the supercharged story time, the expert information that all of us have already at our fingertips to share and help support parent learning and engagement with their children. Sometimes doing that in live story time feels awkward um, because the kids are there and sometimes in a recorded story time it also feels awkward because of the audience. Um, you know, you can't see the audience and you know who's the real audience for virtual story times. I mean it's kids right so think about other ways you can get that information out there. 
Um, the reason I'm bringing this up in an accessible library programming training is that um, parents with kids with disabilities are often so focused on supporting their child and the disability that um, we can sometimes forget that parents with kids with disabilities have the right to this early literacy information too. Books and reading is something for all children, regardless of their ability. And so especially at that early intervention stage, when parents are and caregivers are trying to assess, you know, are their kids at the right developmental stage and level, um, these tips and this information can be especially helpful. So it's not just thinking about the kids themselves, but also the parents and guardians. I should say that that link um, sends you to a link of um, tips for you and your baby videos that our librarians have done um, and we now have on YouTube and Facebook. So how do you set up your virtual story time to really make for um, an accessible and possibly like most inclusive experience as possible? Now, Everybody is different, so everyone might have their own different needs when it comes to engaging in your story time. But there are some good practices that are going to help other children with different disability, and I'll talk to you why. You know, hopefully we're all very organized and putting together our virtual story times, and I think that there's really benefit to having organization in a way that you are very comfortable going from component to component, step by step, um, even maybe working through a schedule of tasks through your story time so that kids can follow along in that repetition or that engagement. There's just a level of comfort and, um, and stability that a presenter has in their presentation when they are doing an organized program. You've seen it, not all presenters and vendors are the same, um, and those that are really more short, that are more organized, that have thought through the transitions, um, the program goes a lot smoother. The same thing goes from um, the point of view of the children with disabilities, because kids, kids glean off of your energy, and so if you yourself are very frazzled and um, working through uh, tasks and maybe you messed up, I mean, of course it's okay to mess up, nobody's perfect, um, but if the whole story time is like that, that is going to um, really project a certain type of environment for the kiddos watching. So having organization allows for kids to be able to concretely follow what's coming next. Um, stability. So even just talking to you today, you know, I have my camera on the top of my computer. And so it's very stable, but I know that if all of a sudden I start touching it and wobbling it around, um, the experience of the viewer is not going to be as positive. Um, so using things like tripods, book stands, even, you know, um, using a a book stand or, or a couple of books to really make sure that your video camera is um, as stable as possible. That will make so that um, the viewer, maybe they have low vision or they are um, a child with um, who, who experiences dizziness or another developmental disability where they really struggle with um, keeping focus. You know, having a stable audio video um, production will really help with that. Consistency is important. That also helps um, the viewer know again what to expect. Um, so, for example, you'll see in this picture of me and my home setup. Um, and for those of you that are wondering, those are cat shelves on my wall. I always get that question. So I just have to call that out um, at the forefront. We do have three cats. So our cats like to sit and perch on there. Um, so this is my setup and I do tape the ground. And for those of us in theater, when you're moving props back and forth on stage, we know that we do this through tape and so that we know exactly where the thing goes um, the next time. So the camera, th there's um, consistency between takes. The same thing goes here. Um, so your viewer is not guessing all over the place for how to find um, or what to find uh, in the visual um, story time. 
always, always, always make sure you test your audio. This is why I think pre-recorded for me is a little bit more stronger of an accessible option because you can hear what it sounds like. You can see the video quality. You can see if the lighting glares on the picture book. For example, I love matte pages. So there are picture books that have glossy pages and there are picture books that have matte pages. Um, the ones that have matte pages don't have any glare but I really struggle with the picture books that have glossy pages because um, sometimes depending on the angle or even as I'm turning the page, it's hard to see the image. And we know that that's going to be the experience of the kids and the grownups also. Um, but also just making sure you're organized yourself. Do you have an outline? Do you have the lyrics taped up? I mean, we don't have to memorize everything. Um, you can see my setup. I'm very open about the fact that I'm not memorizing these lyrics, but I do have them very close to the, um, the camera so that I can quickly see my place um, or check out where I am in the outline of the program in case I forget. I wanna encourage you to look into this wonderful resource that a colleague of mine who runs the Adaptive Umbrella blog runs. Um, she has taken the concept of sensory story time and transformed it into a really inclusive, wonderful virtual story time. So it's a virtual sensory story time. She, play, she has put out that program um, and she's put out an outline of everything that she does. Um, the video that's on this blog will also tell you how to set it up and what are some things to look for. You can see just right in this image, there's a lot of high color contrast. The images are very large and she has her camera or her laptop very, very close. She's also really organized and set up very well. So I'd highly recommend um, checking out this resource because if you already have done sensory story time in person, you might wanna think about a virtual sensory story time. And she talks about ways she incorporates the different senses into the virtual environment. So she talks about smells that you might smell, or she talks about textures using um, really unique vocabulary that really might draw out um, different senses. So it's a wonderful resource. I highly recommend you looking into it. I also want to talk about content because representation matters. So the books you're choosing, the topics you're choosing, the themes, Everything really should reflect your community. And again, like what I said before, don't be afraid to talk about disability and kids with disabilities. Kids seeing themselves on screen in a virtual story time is fantastic. We need to be book, books need to be windows, mirrors and sliding glass doors for each individual child and to understand others as well. Um, we've talked about the senses and addressing them. Um, you know, one of the, the tips that I say when it comes to songs is that not every kid jives on music and that's cool. We know that that's true for story time anyway, but we also need to make sure that we validate all types of movement. So if you're in virtual story time and you're standing up to do a song, you know, you can say, I'm gonna stand up, but if, if you don't want to, that's okay. Or I'm gonna move my arms like this. If you find another way to move your arms, that's okay too. You know, find what feels good. Um, there is a, a yogi on YouTube that uses that phrase, find what feels good. And I love it. And I think it really validates all abilities and and all movement abilities too. Um, and thinking about literacy, I talked about multiple means of representation earlier. And so we really wanna think about how you're incorporating multi-representation or multimodal literacy into your program. And what do I mean by that? So if you're talking about a concept, you're not just talking about it and the information is coming out of your mouth, you're also going to show visuals. And oftentimes visuals may mean flannel boards. And so a fantastic resource that I like to recommend is Storytime in the Stacks. And um, Jessica, who runs the blog, she talks all about ways you can use flannel boards to help kids with a variety of different abilities understand concepts, vocabulary, and make meaning. 
So um, I also really like flannels because that's another thing that does not catch any glare. Um, so for those of you that use flannel and maybe you um, laminate a picture, you know, I might reconsider the use of an actual piece of flannel because it really translates so much better on screen. The color contrast is vibrant um, and it provides for a lot more flexibility. So making sure that you are um, thinking about multiple means of representation, not just in your words or the sounds or the, the book itself, the text, but also visuals. And for those of you that have experience with sensory story time or know what picture exchange communication systems are, these images might be familiar to you. So I first learned about PECS when I was observing a special education classroom. And I learned that it really is a communication system for people, children, students, um, who are either nonverbal, who have autism or some other disability that really um, benefits from that visual processing. So some people process auditorily. So if you have, you know, um, if you're listening to me talk right now, maybe you're doing something else or um, you're not looking on screen, but you're an auditory processor, that means that's your strength and you can process that way. But I'm also, me personally, I'm a visual processor. So I really like having visuals. They help can make connections in my brain. And so in the same way, PECs also help make those connections for children and students that um, may have different uh, access to language. And so I often might create a visual schedule in my in-person sensory story time. I can do that online. Um, I could do that just in person, you know, as I'm recording, having a visual um, list, either vertical or horizontal, of the tasks that I'm doing. So first I'm going to sing a song, then I'm going to read a book, then I'm going to sing another song. And that schedule represents each thing that I'm going to do. The Noun Project is a free resource where you can get high contrast black and white images and icons for almost anything. And it's free to use, free to actually download and then use in your programming, um, completely open source. Um, and, and really what you can do then is, is help kids follow along in their structure. So accessibility also means thinking about what we're saying and how we're saying it to be more inclusive. I've talked about how perfect perfection doesn't exist. That's like my own struggle. I'm like a super perfectionist and I, I really struggle with that all the time, but I need to be kind to myself and remember that even if I try to think about every accessibility thing, I'm gonna miss something and um, that's, that's okay, I'm learning. Delivery, we also want to think about the way that we're engaging with our audience. So, um, you know, I've done this presentation before, and so I'm really comfortable with the content. And so I'm really comfortable looking directly in the camera to you all, pretty much for the majority of the presentation. Um, so the more you're organized, the more you practice, the more that you engage with your audience, um, even through camera, will really help connect with your users but also making sure that your pacing is slow. And I'm also really bad at this, I have to admit. Um, so I'm Italian, I'm very verbose, my, I talk fast, um, and I've really had to learn to slow down so that people who are processing at a different level and a different pace um, in a different way, frankly, um, are able to understand and um, process that information that I'm communicating with them. I talked about color contrast and I'm showing you a picture of what not to do, actually. Um, this is when we first started our story times and we realized that the difference between orange and pink when we were looking at the video at the end um, was actually not that different. And even though we separated them across the whiteboard and we had pink on one corner and orange on the other, for someone that either is colorblind or has visual disabilities, the difference of that color contrast is not all that different. So um, we went back and we edited those homes um, so that they had much higher contrast, even as they were all together in a group. 
if you're doing something on screen, um, maybe you're acting out emotion, um, it's really important to also give an audio description of what you're doing. So I'm gonna reach my hands up really wide, like a circle and just kind of float my arms up there. I don't know, I just made that up. But um, I'm gonna describe the movement or I'm gonna touch my toes. Can you tap your toes with your hands or your fingertips? Those are ways for people who are more auditory processors to engage. And again, if they have any vision differences, um, the auditory information will, able, will be able to support them in engaging in the program. And of course, making sure you have very little to no background noise. Um, I had to put all three of my cats away during my virtual recording of my story times. And then my husband had to guard the door so that they didn't pull the lever down and come out. Um, you know, really thinking about your production and making sure that as much as you can, of course, perfection doesn't exist, um, you can control for those things. So um, what to say? Um, I'm going to say this very briefly because I know we're running short on time, um, but words matter and how you talk about disability and people who have disabilities matters. And there is not understanding or even agreement in the disability community about what to say and how to say it. So there are some people in the disability community that talk about identity first language and that phrase autistic person is an example of identity first language. So that means those people who really align with identity first, they think of themselves as not separate from their disability, um, but really they are one and the same, they are inseparable. Um, in fact, there's a sense of pride in that disability. But there's also um, person first language and you often may hear that in special education um, circles too. So some people may prefer saying I am a person with autism or a person with disabilities. That's why you've heard me say today in the presentation, I go back and forth between person first and identity first. Although the more and more people I get to know with disabilities, the more I learn that people with disabilities often um, prefer identity first. So what to do, um, ask the person what their preferences are. And, um, you know, you may want to consider using both as a way to represent and honor um, and acknowledge that both, um, both are okay. And both um, people I, um, identify with both. So another way that you can really think about delivery is leveraging your technology. Um, for those of you that have explored Zoom backgrounds, um, you know, kudos to you. Um, there's also a way that you can edit and create your own Zoom background. And this special education profession, um, professional actually integrated the visual schedule or the pecs, the images that represent a task or a concept or an idea and created the visual schedule on screen in the Zoom background so that she as a presenter could very clearly walk through that schedule with everybody. And also it could be magnified and very, very large for all the viewers to see. I thought it was just a phenomenal idea um, and I'm totally gonna steal and share it with everybody. So you're done with your story time. You wanna think about making sure that in post-production you have time to actually edit it. Um, and sometimes a great way of thinking about how you can be more accessible is thinking outside of yourself and having a colleague even just look at it and giving you a different point of view about your program is very helpful. It's also um, a moment of vulnerability. You know, we may not like recording ourselves and having someone else tell us how we can do better. You know, there's some trust and vulnerability that's required, um, but that will help us think of things that we, we didn't think about before. The more we edit, the more we get to know and are comfortable with our technology and our platform, um, the more we can really use that platform and that technology to our benefit. I love integrating um, automatic transitions into my virtual story time videos, because what I found is as the pandemic continues, the brain and the, uh, the eyes really need a constant refresh. And so um, that's why you've seen a lot of slides for me today. The more we can um, kind of mix up the visual um, and help 
provide like an opportunity to, to have a clean slate visually, um, the more engagement we might get from people. And so um, I've been trying to use some of those iMovie transitions to wipe away the screen or to open up the screen into a new section of the program. And I really try to incorporate that more and more. And that can help people with a visual cue to understand that, okay, now we're transitioning to something else. And always because you're here, you know, you are interested in learning and you're interested in, in improving your program and improving your story time. So when you want to think about evaluation, really make sure you're adopting a process improvement mindset. Um, you know, working with your manager, working with members of the disability community, maybe a parent or a caregiver or a teacher, a special ed teacher that can preview the, the video and give you some tips and pointers. Um, I actually co-presented, I presented a program last April, but designed it and planned it in a cooperative way with, um, with a young adult with autism. Um, his name is Alex, he's in library school. Um, and he and I used to work at the same library. I was his uh, volunteer supervisor and Alex himself is on the spectrum. And now he wants to learn um, how to be a librarian. That's like its own amazing story in and of itself. Um, but I really wanted to validate his experience and his um, lived experiences in talking about creating an autism virtual story time. So all about autism, what is autism and um, how do kids with autism engage with the world? How do they navigate the world? He and I co-created that program together. I sent him some ideas, I got his feedback. Um, and so really working with a partner to think of ways you can continue to evaluate your program and um, integrate some best practices um, because that also elevates um, the disabled voice and those that have disabilities. Um, and if you have staff on staff that have disabilities and they are comfortable doing virtual story times, have them represent if they're interested, um, they could also be visible story time presenters as, as well. That representation is really powerful. So um, just a couple of tips about inclusive marketing and then we'll finish up here. Um, making sure that if you do include ASL interpretation or captioning that you say that you do in your program description so that people know ahead of time. Um, and then also thinking about tagging some of your virtual partners on social media or wherever you host your, um, your videos so that they know that it's out there. Um, we actually have a young, um, a young adult who's in middle school in Dakota County. Um, he is part of um, a little pro a project for us to help promote our accessible library services. And he himself um, is on the spectrum and he uh, proudly is part of our um, our ads that we put on social media um, to talk about how our library has accessible services for all abilities. And um, he loves talking about how he is, he's famous. I mean, he really is famous um, for the library. And again, like he sees himself um, and that uh, mirror, that reflection is really powerful. Um, here's an example of some really great high contrast signage. I thought it would be helpful to include. So you can see how we're incorporating these WCAG 2.1 guidelines. I provided some inclusive marketing tips as well, um, such as using plain language, you know, scrapping all the library jargon. And yes, we know alliteration is cute. It's amazing. Just talk about what the program is. That helps people who speak English as a new language. It also helps for meaning making for people who have um, different disabilities as well. I've talked about a lot of this already. So really just thinking about ways that you can make your accessible, your virtual programs more accessible. Um, if you have transcripts, making them available. Um, how have you made your programs open or closed access? And what are the um, impl implications of that for the disability community? Having a library website page that is just dedicated to all of your library's accessible services 
having video tours about what your library is like right now in this pandemic and making so that people know what services you offer. Having that video really can help um, people who, again, learn by video and um, people who also need a little bit more support in knowing what to expect. And with that, we put we created a virtual um, social narrative to explain what the experience is in the library um, during our express services during this current pandemic. And it's a great tool to help kids with disabilities, really anybody with photos, um, know what they can expect when they come into the library. So you'll have a link to that as well. You can see that we've, um, we've played around with uh, using ASL interpretation in some of our virtual programs. And we've also collaborated with some of our um, community partners at the local deaf school um, to develop promotional videos in ASL with a voiceover so that people in the deaf community and the hearing community can know what's coming up about a program. And so lastly, in these final minutes, huge, huge thanks to ELSC and everybody on the Virtual Storytime Services Guide team. We put this together for you all so that you can plan virtual story times more effectively. And it brings together all those best practices. There's even a whole section on accessibility and serving kids with disabilities. If you're interested in learning more about serving kids with disabilities, serving any age, um, and making your customer service in your libraries more accessible, check out Project Enable, which is a free self-paced online resource full of tutorials and videos and articles about disability awareness learning. And if your library has some budget to spend on training, I highly recommend the, Accessi the Accessibility Academy through RUSA, which is a division of ALA. So I know we have four minutes left um, and I wanna honor time. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'd be glad to, um, yes, the slides are going to be shared with everybody in the conference. Is that right, Lauren? Yes, every single presentation for the conference will will send the slides. They will be on our website. The re uh, recordings will be on our website too. So just be a little bit patient with us as we get this all together, but I promise everyone will get the slides and the recordings. Yep, thank you so much, Lauren. I'm seeing a question in the chat. Um, interesting that you mentioned the orange and pink. I'm having difficulty seeing the difference between blue and green. Julie, you bring up a really good point um, that the blue and green also needed to be ad adapted. Um, and this is where I think a very, very nice close up of the visuals that you're trying to show really can benefit everybody. So if you're trying to identify the difference between houses, don't just think about color. You know, think of other means of representation. Maybe it's houses in general, like the bird house or the boat house or the apartment, because not everybody owns a house. Um, so thinking about ways that are more inclusive will help everybody. And thank you everybody for coming today. Really appreciate the conference and Lauren and Dorcas for all your help. If anybody has questions, please go ahead. We have a few minutes before we have to wrap up, but if you have a question, please go ahead and type it in the chat. Thank oh, thanks you. everybody. I love all the feedback. Um, yes, and I'm glad to stay if there are any questions. And thank you all. Um, you know, we don't, Hopefully you're hearing it every day or a lot, but thank you for what you do. Um, working with Youth Matters, Youth Matters, and Youth Librarians Matter, um, and hopefully you're all taking care of yourselves today. I want to give a special shout out and say my heart is with Atlanta and all of the Asian American um, community throughout the, throughout the country right now. Um, I know this is a really difficult time, and, um, and you are in my thoughts. We do have two questions. Yes. One asks, is there a template for the PEX library storytime schedule? Well, Natalie, I would recommend looking into a company called Boardmaker. And Boardmaker is the official company that creates um, those images that you saw on screen. I've also had librarians and special education teachers tell me it's okay to use even just a graphic 
like the noun project database that I showed you, or even um, an image like a clip art image um, to represent a different task that you're doing in story time. Um, Boardmaker is a subscription service and special education teachers use it in their classrooms um, all the time. And so some libraries have subscription to it and they use it for their programming. And there's also a way to um, integrate it into virtual schedules as well. Um, and if you search uh, the ELSC blog, in fact, Lauren, I could probably send you this article. I have a whole blog post about using visual schedules in programs, and that will be able to um, give you more information about that. I'm going to write that down. Yeah, Natalie, I think it's just a matter of representation. Board maker really is um, often used in special education education classes. So it's like a language. It is a language. It's a communication system, right? And so there are specific ways that people who use it interact with it. And it's a recognized set of images. Um, but if you are looking for a free option, that's why I was suggesting project um, noun, the noun project might be a good place to go. I will send that link to you, Lauren, to share with the resources too. Okay. Another question was, how are you offering live captioning? Does a staff member do it? It seems like a unique skill. Yes. So at first, we thought that that was the only option that was available to us, which was hiring someone and paying someone to do live captioning. Um, but now there is a very affordable subscription service called Otter AI. So Otter like the animal and then the letters A and I. Um, our county added a couple of subscriptions to Otter AI, and um, now it integrates directly into Zoom. Lauren and Dorcas, is that what you're using today? We're actually just using the auto caption from Zoom. And that was the other thing I was going to say too. So Zoom now, they didn't always have this in the pandemic, but Zoom now has auto captioning features as well. So. Um, Otter AI is a sub subscription. If you have a certain level of um, subscription for Zoom, that auto caption feature is available in there. And I think there is a live transcription feature in the latest version of Microsoft Office PowerPoint. So if you are presenting a PowerPoint, um, I believe using the latest version of it, um, they now have live captioning as well. It's becoming um, and it's amazing that it took a pandemic for this to happen um, because it was the masses, unfortunately. But um, now that uh, technology is much, much more available and accessible. Good questions. One last question. Um, someone asked, I have so much to learn to leverage my tech knowledge. What would you recommend as a good resource for learning? Well, I think it would depend on what specifically you're interested in learning. Um, you know, working with your library's IT department, if you have one, um, sharing these resources from today to them, even just the WCAG 2.1 guidelines, those are really easy to walk through and um, understandable. Now those are the guidelines, but it doesn't tell you how to fix them. So that's why I think, you know, youth librarians can't do everything. Um, we really need to work in partnership with everybody in our library to advocate for accessibility. So it's not just our role, it really is everyone. So I might just collaborate or reach out to your um, your tech librarian or your IT manager um, and say you attended this program and, um, and ask if they have any expert um, knowledge or tips or advice for you as well. All right. I think that is all for questions. So thank you so much, Renee, for being here today and for sharing all this information. I know I've learned so much. Um, and thank you to everyone for attending our webinar. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact one of the conference hosts and we'll be glad to work with you. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, as well as a link to download a CEU certificate. And we would really appreciate if you would complete the survey with any feedback that you have for this session.
So thanks everyone and be sure to join us tomorrow for our last day of the conference um, for our concurrent sessions starting at 1230. Um, the first one is speak up responding to uncomfortable situations and then building a digital branch your users will love. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye.